students, I know that we are all excited. What a joy. Can you feel this vibe? I can feel it. It's very, very strong. So welcome, dear students, dear participants, dear members of the Henri Duneau Prize Foundation, dear board members, dear faculty and teaching assistants, dear colleagues and friends. Welcome to this graduation ceremony of the Geneva Academy for the academic year 2021-2022. You did it. Congratulations. <laughs> what a pleasure. What a pleasure to see you here in this well-named Auditoire Droit de l'Homme in Unimile and to know that many more are attending online. Tonight is an important and joyful moment. First, because we are celebrating the success of the students and participants of our three master's programs the LLM in International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights, the Master on Transitional Justice Human Rights, and the Rule of Law, the Executive Master in International Law in Armed Conflict. Dear students, in total, you are 122. 46 LLM students, 42 MTJ students, 34 XMAS participants, and you succeeded in one of the three highly competitive programs. So congratulations. This is really an important achievement. It's an achievement that gives me hope for our world. Indeed, when I see your smiling faces, I see a bright future. A future built on four key pillars, not the pillars of transitional justice, but still pillars of values. And you'll note that all these pillars of values that I've chosen finish with T and Y, like the initials of thank you, because we are so thankful that you chose the academy to pursue your studies. So let me start with the first pillar. The first pillar is diversity. How beautiful and gratifying it is to see that you came from all around the world to take part in our programs. I could name a long list of 54 countries. All countries are represented with a variety, all, all continents are represented with a variety of countries from Argentina to Zimbabwe, from Azerbaijan to Venezuela, from the US to Ethiopia. When I talk about diversity, I do not only refer to geographical diversity, but also socioeconomic diversity. Studying abroad is costly, and in Geneva particularly, and we know that this can discourage talented students. This is why we are so grateful for the support of private donors and foundations, which allowed us to offer 28 scholarships in 2021 and 2022 to exceptional students from all around the world to participate in our programs. We hope to be able to maintain and expand the number of scholarships we can offer in the future. As we did two years ago, uh, we are going to launch a crowdfunding scholarship at the end of the year. And we hope to be able to count on you, alumni and our community to participate even with small amounts to allow other deserving students to take part in our programs. The second pillar that I have chosen is tenacity. Let's face it, the three master's programs at the Geneva Academy are extremely challenging. Succeeding in our programs requires reading hundreds of papers, of case laws, books, reports, scholarly writings. It requires adapting to different styles, teaching methods, disciplines, especially for the MTJ. It requires also juggling with different priorities, with exams, papers to submit, internships, or even jobs, often full-time jobs for our XMAS participants. And despite these difficulties, the success rate is impressive. 
nobody failed this year in the LLM and MTJ programs. Some students had to do some retakes. But what are retakes in a life? Nothing, isn't it? So really, bravo. And I can assure you that this is not because professors were nice. I mean, we are very nice. We have very nice professors for sure, but they are also extremely demanding. So you can definitely be proud of you. I would like to acknowledge and congratulate as well your parents, brothers and sisters, friends who supported you in this endeavor. We are also grateful to our professors and teaching assistants who brought you to such a level of proficiency in the domains that we teach at the academy. And this leads me to the third pillar that is a kind of synonymous of proficiency, finishing with TI. And this is capacity. By completing one of our master's programs, you have developed numerous capacities. Capacity to conduct complex legal analysis, capacity to apply IHL and human rights law to concrete situations and challenges our world is facing, capacity to think out of the box and innovate, capacity to think critically, capacity to build bridges between different international legal frameworks and disciplines. These capacities and competencies are needed to build peace, to bring justice and truth, to protect the dignity of every person, to maintain humanity in wars. Yes, humanity. And this is my fourth and last pillar. This last pillar is what unites us all and what makes studying at the Academy so special. Behind the creation of the Academy 15 years ago, there is a dream. The dream that by disseminating knowledge around the legal frameworks applying to armed conflict situations and by addressing post-conflict situations and transitional phases in a holistic manner, we could ultimately enhance the protection of individuals in situations of vulnerability. When I look back at what our alumni had achieved and what they do now, working in the field, working for humanitarian organizations, NGOs, international organizations, states, I can say that this vision and dream have materialized. And this dream will certainly continue to guide us for the years to come. And you are part of it, part of this dream. You are the next generation of international lawyers, of humanitarian workers, of human rights experts. Our world is in your hands. We count on you to uphold the values that permit the international law branches and disciplines that we teach at the Academy. Talking now about alumni making a difference and contributing to the dissemination of such values, please let me now give the floor to Mr. Etienne Custer, who is one of our alumni and who is now Senior Advisor for Relations with Academic Circles at the International Committee of the Red Cross and who is a member of our board. So I'm really very much looking forward to listening to your welcoming remarks on acting humanitarian select thoughts, wishes, and encouragements. Etienne, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Director Gajoli, Professor Gajoli, dear Gloria. Uh, for the small anecdotes, I think um, I'd like to pay tribute also to you because when you were, uh, a teaching assistant here, I believe uh, you taught me most of what I know today in IHL, in human rights, in public international law relating to the use of force. So thank you for that. Uh, this is not and will never be forgotten. Dear graduates, dear students, dear professors, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I feel humbled to have been asked to speak on behalf of the ICRC at this graduation ceremony. First and foremost, I'd like to start uh, by conveying you all my sincere congratulations on your achievements and well-deserved diplomas that you are receiving today. Well done. When envisaging the various possible themes of my intervention, I had, of course, to consider international humanitarian law, IHL, which is the core part of the DNA of the Geneva Academy. What could we say about IHL today? 
other than that it is so badly needed and so badly at stake at the same time. Has it ever been otherwise? And what is IHL if not a tool, although a key one? No, what I'd like to talk to you about is not IHL as such, but what we make of IHL and how we ought to use it. I want to talk to you about acting humanitarian. Beyond operational aspects, humanitarianism has been defined as an active belief in the value of human life. I believe we don't need to know much farther than that to how, how to, I don't, need, we know, I don't think we need to know how much farther than that to know how to use IHL. And it all starts here, learning about IHL, figuring out all of its scope, aspects, provisions, limitations, possibilities, discussing them, challenging and supporting them. One cannot make anything of IHL if she or he does not know it first. This may be the point you are at, or so you believe. We can all be extremely grateful to the Geneva Academy for the dedication of its directors, professors, researchers, staff, and students for their continued high-level commitment to make IHL known, discussed, clarified, accepted, and used by so many professionals and academics worldwide. Some say knowledge is power. When it comes to IHL, I believe knowledge means protection for those who need it most. For me, an active belief in the value of human life, acting humanitarian or as a humanitarian is to learn, teach and research IHL faithfully. As professionals having studied IHL, we inevitably come confronted with the reality of today's armed conflicts. The discrepancy we may see between theory and practice is often worrying, sometimes extremely bleak. Today is unfortunately no exception. This is a time where doubts arise in ourselves and in others. Temptation is great to give up and discard the law when feeling discouraged, faced with horrors. I believe acting humanitarian is to face horror and act against it, remedy it and prevent it. Acting humanitarian very often means going against the flow, be treated as naive, idealistic or utopian. It also means not caring about such labels and continue acting with all we've got to resist, remedy and prevent horror for it to never happen again. Back then, I joined the CUDI, the Center for Humanitarian, uh, Inter International Humanitarian Law, the predecessor of the Academy, because I wanted to give back at least a tiny fraction of everything I had received being born in peaceful Switzerland and raised by loving parents. The Academy has given me knowledge and hope, discovering in Geneva, the very city I was born in, an entire new vast world of open, committed, radiating students and teachers. You are no exception. I still cherish this knowledge and this hope very dearly. Those are not only the lights that keep me going on supporting, on to support teaching, debate and research in IHL worldwide at the ICRC. They are also gifts I choose to honor in my life. I believe there is no other path for me in this world and this belief only grows bigger with every single reported horror I come across in my work or in the media. I believe acting humanitarian means to be affected beyond my own will and to translate this into always trying my best to resist, remedy and prevent horror. Representing the ICRC in the board of the Geneva Academy, I have witnessed for years the formidable capacity this humanitarian school has developed to continue its mission and adapt it to opportunities, constraints and novelty. This is a place for those who want to act humanitarian. I believe acting humanitarian may also mean joining the Geneva Academy family. Now that I've shared select thoughts, here are my wishes. I wish for an open world with more people acting humanitarian. I wish for a supportive world who sees acting humanitarian not as a weakness, but as an, an ideal. 
I wish for a peaceful world who does not need humanitarians anymore. And to finish with one encouragement, that for us all to strive to act humanitarian as much and as often as we can, and with all those crossing our path. Only thus can we be said to share an active belief in the value of human life. I commend you on your efforts, on who you are, and on who you want to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Etienne, for these inspiring remarks, wishes, and encouragements. Please let me invite now my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Sandra Cranman, who is Senior Policy and Legal Advisor at the Geneva Co. So Sandra has been teaching at the Geneva Academy for many years. She knows the Academy extremely well. She also worked there as a researcher, and even before that, uh, as a teaching assistant. She was actually one amongst the first generation of the teaching assistants of the Geneva Academy. And I will always keep very fond memories of the time where we were sharing an office in this building on the third floor. And uh, we were preparing uh, the cases, the case studies, the tutorials, and we were having uh, vivid discussions, passionate discussions about international law. And this was 15 years ago, <laughs> but we are still young. <laughs> so Sandra, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much, Gloria, for this introduction. So welcome to all of our graduates. I think we cannot overstate how much of a joyous event it is tonight to be here with all of you together with your family, our friends, um, dear colleagues from the Geneva Academy, our teaching assistants, who we all know are the backbone of this institution, members of the board. It's always so great that once a year we get to meet and to celebrate. Gloria, you just stole my anecdote about our history together. I also wanted to speak about how we were up in the third floor. I was not going to mention the 15-year part, okay? So, <laughs> but... Um, Indeed, um, as many of you know, I have been associated with the Geneva Academy actually for many, many years in various roles, including when it was still the QD, when we were teaching assistants together, and then later on as a research fellow, and now for the past couple of years, I had the great pleasure of teaching in the MTJ and then teaching also in the Executive Masters, which has been extremely rewarding and rich. As you also know, and I like to say to my students, teaching is actually my hobby. It's my sidekick. No? Some people say I need a better hobby. Well, I personally think there is no better hobby than teaching. You know, And it's not just the teaching during the year, which is always rich and stimulating, in particularly actually also, and apologies to the LLM, it's just because I don't teach in your class, with the MTJ, you know, where we have students from so many different backgrounds, not just legal, who bring up entirely new questions I've never even thought about, or in the executive masters who bring up the questions of practitioners that I sometimes actually also often face, and then we finally get to discuss this together. So it's the most rewarding experience. What is even more rewarding is then actually not just the teaching, but the way how I've come across all of our students during the past four years in a broad variety of roles as humanitarian practitioners or as transitional justice specialists. I have come across our students working for the various UN agencies in the field, in headquarters for humanitarian organizations, including, but not only the ICRC, I have come across them working for the EU humanitarian programming, ECHO, for NGOs, Save the Children, Terre des Hommes, literally wherever I go, there is an academy student. It's, it's a bit concerning. <laughs> I have not yet come across an academy student within an aunt group. And if now we are making wishes for the future, I would like us to remain like this. If you decide this is your path, I would expect nothing less than absolute compliance, regardless of your capacity. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And then even though this may go a little bit beyond our mandate, I would actually also expect you to work towards peace, put in practice the concept of a collective responsibility of an armed group to provide remedies and reparations. And here I'm looking at my transitional justice students. So, and that's where we would actually need a little bit of advancement. I've also come across my students as representatives of government for humanitarian programming, or as I like to call them now, donors. So make no mistake, I'm gonna ask you for money if that is your path, okay? <laughs> so, and then I would like to remind you that at the end of the day, we all belong to this wonderful community that is actually the Geneva Academy that is made up for me, and when I think about what's the gift that the Academy has given me, it's the people. It's people like Gloria. We have known each other for 15 years now. And so we were teaching assistants together and now we have been working together and we've always been friends. People like the teaching assistants. It's our students, our alumni. All of this actually represents the Geneva Academy. Um, and I really look very much forward for the Geneva Academy to continue doing what it is doing, forming great people, working in such a broad variety of roles all over the world in different humanitarian contexts. I've mentioned now that how you not only have to work for the ICRC, um, also you don't only have to be a legal advisor. So there are many, many different kinds of positions and I've been reflecting, who do I know most from the Geneva Academy in my work life? Because I actually happen to have four colleagues at Geneva Call who are alumni of the Geneva Academy, including two alumni of the Masters in Transitional Justice. We have Fiuze, who is a former teaching assistant, who is now our head of program in Myanmar. We have our own Katie tonight, who is now a reporting <laughs> officer. <laughs> to Afghanistan, and from the executive master from the previous year, we have Rosella, who is now in our grants and compliance department. So just to show you the scope of roles that then is actually available for graduates of the Geneva Academy, that does not need to be limited to a particular niche. And um, to conclude, because I don't want to take too much time away from your celebration, not our celebration, congratulations again. And today is just the beginning of your success. Thank you very much, Sandra, for these wonderful remarks and cheerful remarks. So now I call three students' representatives who are go going to give a few speeches. I call Ms. Filzan Einen. Thank you. Good evening, professors, distinguished guests, family and friends and colleagues. Around a time like this last year, our director, Professor Gagioli, made an opening speech. In it, she said that each of us was carefully chosen for this course. The feelings of excitement and elation were unmatched. But it was around the first weeks of school and we were yet to receive our first on the hook emails from Yulia. <laughs> Or come to learn three different theories on whether or not human rights exist during conflict. <laughs> Fast forward to August of this year, I meet a lawyer and we get to talking. She asks where I studied. I tell her the Geneva Academy. And she asks, how was your experience? I heard it was a super competitive uh, course. And I said, maybe, but I'd like to think we unionized. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't pinpoint the exact moment we unionized, whether it was showing up for colorful Mondays, performing karaoke at Pickwick's, sharing notes, or being vulnerable enough to share tips on dealing with exam anxiety. All I know is that we quickly came to the realization that we were in this together and we will get through it uh, a little bit older <laughs> with more wrinkles, <laughs> gray hair, but together. <laughs> now, this LLM has afforded us the opportunity to learn from leading scholars in their fields. Our professors shared their wealth of knowledge and experience with us and challenged us to match their expert legal theory with their own. 
They fostered vibrant class discussions and were always available to take on questions we had. They also gave us tips on what not to say in our ICRC hiring interviews. <laughs> uh, they gave us anecdotes about their time in their field, unreserved opinions, questions, and encouraged us to, do, to go a step further, to believe that the work we were doing was not studying to get a grade, but to make something of a difference. It has been an absolute honor to learn from the best. I'd also like to express our deepest gratitude to our teaching assistants, some of whom we'd been with from our very class to our very, from our very first to our very last class. Whether it was chocolates, office memes, quizzes to jog our memories, Star Wars jokes, or going full lecture mode for every question we asked. <laughs> Each tutorial was unique and a pleasure to participate in. Thank you for your help. We could not have done it without you. To our family and friends, thank you for being with us through one of the most academically challenging time of our lives and for your unwavering support. We were so happy to share with you what has been our lives for the past year. To my colleagues, <laughs> the next chapter of our lives will come with uncertainty about jobs or PhDs, but if we can get through the demands of pleadings and internships, uh, or the chaos of canceled flights and having to make our way to the Balkans, <laughs> then we can survive the uncertainties of job hunting. Just like this LLM, it will most likely be a struggle, leading us to question every life choice we've made. But just like this LLM, it will lead us to meet amazing people and inspiring people and eventually do exciting things. Students at the Geneva Academy come from all parts of the world with different experiences and ideas of who we want to be. This program has given us knowledge, skills, and confidence to affirm our belief that we are meant for this field. Moreover, it gave us friends and mentors who we will forever remain grateful for. Thank you for being a part of this roller coaster of a ride. And with this, I can declare you're officially off the hook. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pilsen. I now call Yaroslav Kazny, an Exmas representative. Thank you, Professor Gagioli. Good evening, dear faculty, staff, family, friends, and fellow graduates. It is an honor to be speaking here with you as a student representative. Fellow graduates of the Executive Master in International Law in Armed Conflict, class of 2022, congratulations. Each and every student graduating today has traveled a remarkable journey to reach this moment. A journey that was not stress-free. It was filled with difficulties, struggles, and constant challenges, testing our motivation to persevere and reach this moment. This journey is embodied in the diploma we receive today. However, the journey is far from over. For some of us, it is a step in a new direction. For others, it is a new beginning. Whatever particular journey we have, the purpose is one, the same, and common to all of us. We are graduating in times of great challenges and threats to the established rule of law and international legal order. Each part of the world faces its own particular difficulties. Many regions struggle with unstable security environment, frequently resulting in humanitarian disasters and destruction. In addition, we are once again witnessing unimaginable atrocities, blatant violations of the law of armed conflict, its humanitarian principles, and even basic rules of human rights law atrocities we thought would never happen again on the European continent. 
As graduates of the executive master's program, we are practitioners, humanitarian workers, diplomats, advocates, media personnel, and experts from international organizations. Whatever our particular field, I believe we are now much better equipped to help those who need it, whether directly or indirectly. After all, Today's reality is the most difficult and challenging exam we are facing. As professors have said many times in our classes, behind the words of the treatise is a purpose, a purpose of protecting human lives and those who need it the most. It is almost unbelievable how quickly is the expertise we have gained being tested and put into practice. I believe I speak for all when I say, and I promise to the professors who patiently answered our questions during classes, offered their time and shared their expertise, that we are leaving here today with a determination. A determination to use the acquired knowledge and skills to make a difference. As graduates of the executive master's program, we are sure to put this knowledge into practice instantly. Thank you and happy graduation to all. Thank you, Yaroslav. Now I call Cameron Case from the MTJ. Thank you all for joining us here today, those of you all in person and those of you online. Class of 2022, it has been an honor to be a student at the Geneva Academy alongside of all of you as we faced a multitude of crises throughout this year, both personal, national, and international altogether. Our ability to be resilient in the face of these challenges though, is what brings us here today. We have faced great adversity throughout the year. First, we left our homes, our families, and our friends, many of us away from home for important holidays, some for the first time. We had to adjust to a new culture, a new bureaucracy, an ever-developing curriculum, a new speed of life, and for many, a new language. Second, we faced a global pandemic head on. Many of us spent our first months in Geneva trying to acquire Swiss approved vaccines so that we could enter the grocery store and the classroom. And then we did it again in February. <laughs> we have had to adopt to hybrid classes, associated technological problems, and felt the social isolations of being stuck in our room. Finally, we witnessed and studied the world's most pressing global crises, from Nigeria to Colombia, from Ukraine to Syria, Burundi to Bosnia, and many more. These global crises broke our hearts, but pervaded our classroom discussions. However, we have not just witnessed them, many of us have also lived them. We have been inspired by the people risking their lives on the ground, such as in Iran and Tajikistan, but also have been inspired by the people in this classroom, those who have come to Geneva to fight for justice, peace, and freedom in their countries, and because of this may not be able to return. Despite, despite all these challenges, however, we have grown as academics, practitioners, and as humans. We have come away more tenacious, fierce, and persistent. Standing here today, I'm filled with gratitude, not only just for our professors and our lovely TAs, but above all, I am most grateful for the peer relationships and unfathomably close friendships that have been formed and will continue to evolve as we support each other in our endeavors. The vulnerability and courage of our classmates to speak up, cultivated empathy, and provided eye-opening experiences that diversified our understandings of the world and its context. Classmates with such different backgrounds and with a heart for transitional justice have pushed our personal and professional boundaries. 
We cannot eradicate conflict and confrontation, but through our year in the MTJ, we have gained invaluable experiences and tools that as like-minded people have united us to pave the way forward for the next generation as transitional justice experts. We can, we can plan our transitions and we can plan our priest processes as much as we want, but its success depends entirely upon being resilient. From our thesis to our group work, from canceled flights to staying up studying all night, the class of 2022 has been pushed through the ringer and pushed to our limits, but we've come out the other side stronger, more confident, and more equipped. I'd like to end with a quote from Bene Brown. You have exactly what it takes to change the world. It won't be on your terms. It won't be on your timeline. The world does not ready itself for our plans. Our ability to live a life of love and meaning, to make the world a braver and kinder place, and to disrupt and restrape the future has nothing to do with the greatness of our plans, but depends completely upon our ability to get back up and begin again when our plans fail. We must be committed to getting back up and beginning again the exact amount of times that we fall, trip, or get pushed down. From Halloween, our Halloween party almost a year ago today, to our study trip to Bosnia and Serbia, from karaoke and beers at Mr. Pickwick's, it's truly been a memorable year. Classes were hard, orals were harder, <laughs> but we did it. Congratulations to you all, and I cannot wait to see what the class of 2022 does. Thank you, Cameron. That was a very profound talk, and I think you, you said it all, really. I have now the honor and pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Professor Marco Roscini, who is our new Swiss IHL chair and who is Professor of International Law at Westminster Law School. He's going to discuss the problems and prospects for future regulation of cyber warfare. Welcome, Marco. Thank you, Gloria, for inviting me. Uh, I haven't taught any of you, sadly, because I've recently joined the Academy, but I couldn't be happier to be here to celebrate your, your, your success. Uh, this is the boring part of the program. Uh, I'm afraid you'll have to endure one final lecture for, for, for the drinks and the celebrations, uh, but I'll try to be as short as possible. Uh, and, and Gloria said that uh, this evening is all about the future. It's about your future. It's about your future career. It's about the future of the academy, the next 15 years, and then the other 15 years, and then the other 15 years. So I thought it was just fitting uh, as a topic for this, uh, this brief speech to talk about the future of uh, the possible uh, uh, prospects for a future regulation, legal regulation of cyber warfare. I'm sure you've come across cyber warfare in several of the classes you've had, right? Surely. So you know the problems that this can cause both in peacetime and uh, in wartime. Uh, and because of this, these problems, there is now, I think, a general agreement among states and uh, relevant organizations and uh, academics as well that existing international law rules do apply in cyberspace. Uh, or at least the general principles, uh, sovereignty, non-intervention, even the prohibition of the use of force. However, uh, this, this, this agreement, this consensus seems to win when we start talking about IHL, when we talk about the application of international humanitarian law in cyberspace. Uh, we do have many states and many actors, including the ICRC, that strongly believe that IHL has a positive role to play. Existing rules, the, the Geneva Conventions, the protocols, so they have a rule apply and therefore they can benefit uh, victims of war. But there are uh, some states, it's a minority of states, but they are uh, vocal and they are influential that actually believe that the identity is no secret. Uh, it's states like Cuba, it's like states like Russia and China, uh, just to mention the probably the most vocal ones. Uh, and these states uh, believe that the application of IHL in cyberspace uh, actually leads uh, or would lead to the militarization 
of cyberspace and therefore to negative uh, results. Uh, I don't think I agree with this conclusion, but uh, this has prevented so far uh, 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 the formation of consensus on uh, on the application of IHL in cyberspace. So while for international law in general, we have moved on from the question, does it apply? The question is not really the weather, but it's how uh, uh, general principles of international law apply in cyberspace. As far as IHL is concerned, we are still very much stuck with the weather. Uh, we haven't moved to the how or not as much as we have in other areas of international law. Uh, but let's assume, let's assume that at some point we'll have this understanding, okay? We said it's all about the future and uh, let's see the future in positive terms. And let's uh, hope that at some point there will be a common understanding in the relevant fora uh, that IHL has a positive role to play in, uh, to protect the victims of conflicts in, uh, included in, in the cyber realm. Uh, it's very likely that the existing rules will not suffice. The existing rules, the Geneva Conventions, the protocols well adopted and shaped and designed well before the information age. Uh, they have kinetic weapons in mind. Uh, they are unlikely to perfectly uh, suit the peculiarities or completely uh, suit the peculiarities of cyber weapons or cyber warfare uh, because of the remoteness of cyber attacks, because of their anonymity, uh, because of their speed. You can attack a target on the other side of the world in a matter of seconds and cause harm that can be of different types, depending on the target, depending on the type of malware you're using, etc. cetera. Uh, so the existing rules are unlikely on their own to, uh, uh, to provide uh, sufficient protection to civilians and other victims of war. Uh, so we are likely uh, uh, to, to, to have to devise uh, at some point like a fifth Geneva Convention, so to speak, uh, on cyber warfare. Uh, and the question, so we do need specific rules. At some point we'll need like think, for instance, of uh, attacks. Attack is a technical term in IHL, as you well know, right? It's an act of violence. Is a cyber attack an attack in, in that sense? That's a question that, of course, you won't, uh, you won't solve by just reading the Geneva Conventions. So clarifying these and other concepts that were drafted in an era which is no longer our, at least not from a technological point of view, uh, will be needed at some point. So what kind of shape could these future specific rules, IHL rules specific to cyber, war, cyber warfare could, uh, could, could have? How could they look like? Well, I'm probably not surprising anyone if I say that in, you, international law has two main sources, right? Customary international law and, uh, and treaty law. Uh, and customary international law is formed by the convergence of two elements. The general practice of states accompanied by a conviction that this practice is required by law, the opinio juris. The problem with the formation of customary international law in uh, cyberspace is that states are, have proved to be very reluctant to do so. Uh, do we have state practice in cyberspace are cyber attacks that you might have heard of uh, Stuxnet, uh, WannaCry or NotPetya or others, are they state practice? Well, we don't know. Uh, we don't know because of the well-known problems related to attribution. It's very easy to hide behind an invisibility cloak if you launch cyber attacks. We have no proof, and obviously there's been no acknowledgement by the attackers, particularly when they are states, of responsibility for any of the cyber attacks that have been conducted so far. So it's very difficult to, we have practice, but it's very difficult to attribute it to states. And states have also been reluctant to speak about what they think 
the law requires them or not uh, to, to do or not to do. So it's very difficult to identify opinion juries in this, in this, in this area. Even when they are the victims of attacks, they are very reluctant to point the finger to name and shame. And when they do, they not often uh, refer to international law. And even when they do, they never, uh, or very seldom, uh, uh, probably the except one case or a couple, they will point at exactly the rule of international law and even less IHL that they think has been breached. So these statements are all very, when we have reactions to attack, so they're all very vague. And obviously this vagueness, uh, this, 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 uh, this secrecy even hampers uh, the formation of customer international law. Uh, just an example that comes to mind, a couple of months ago, Albania has been the victim of comprehensive cyber attacks uh, and Albania uh, in a letter to the United Nations also uh, pointed a finger uh, against Iran, saying that it was Iran that was behind it uh, and uh, governmental portals uh, were down and uh, users could not uh, do things uh, and uh, use certain services. Uh, the attack was quite significant uh, in technological terms. There was no physical damage, but apparently the, the disruption was significant and Albania was quite upset, as I said, including uh, by writing to the United Nations and denouncing the attacks and pointing the fingers. But if you read that letter, you will not read the words international law, not even once. Okay, there's a reference to norms of responsible behavior, but there's not even one word about the law. Uh, which is significant, and again, it's just an example of uh, the, the, the attitude of states, the reluctance of states to, to, to refer to international law in this area. Uh, having said that, it is also fair to say that in the last uh, 10, 15 years, probably for the duration of, uh, of the, 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 the life of the academy, uh, this has coincided with states, some states at least, uh, starting to express their views. Not in relation, not as a reaction to attacks, uh, but more in general by publishing statements, uh, uh, position statements, uh, normally in the UN framework, in the UN frameworks that address information security, but not only. Uh, and some military manuals also have some chunky sections on cyber warfare, the US uh, laws of war manual, the Danish one, uh, the Norwegian one as well, if I'm not mistaken. So states are starting to, to, to speak up and that might well be the beginning of a more open approach uh, that states will have in the future. And this more open approach uh, might contribute to the formation of special customer international uh, humanitarian law or, or, or that addresses uh, the problem of uh, cyber, cyber warfare. Uh, the alternative is conclu to conclude a treaty. Again, what I called, uh, no, it's not my expression, but I'm borrowing it, the Fifth Geneva Convention on, uh, on uh, Cyber Warfare, whether it is concluded in Geneva or not. Uh, uh, in fact, it is states like Russia and China that have championed uh, since at least 1998 the conclusion on a treaty regulating state activities in cyberspace. Other states uh, on the other side of the fence have been actually reluctant in following this path. Uh, they believe uh, that uh, existing mechanisms, uh, particularly law enforcement mechanisms, uh, have been sufficient uh, to address at least uh, what is the most frequent type of uh, cybersecurity threats like cybercrime and, and similar. But in a way, uh, so this 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 uh, this dichotomy uh, 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 seems to, in a way, recall the situation back in 1899, uh, when you when it was Russia, uh, when it was uh, Tsar Nicholas II who had the idea or, 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 or sponsored the Hague the Hague Conventions of 1899. If you go to the Hague, to the Peace Palace, the first thing that you see when you enter from the main door is uh, his statue uh, that looks down at you because he was the, 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 the inspiration uh, of, uh, of the Hague Conventions. Um, was that the 
because of the kindness of his heart might well be the that's, that's not ruled out by the fact that russia also had a practical interest in the conclusion of those conventions because it was unable to 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 keep pace uh, with the arms race uh, that states like uh the uk and germany were more able to afford so putting limitations on weapons and their use uh, was actually something that played in the hands of russia uh, uh and we are probably in the same similar situation uh, russia does not perceive that it is uh, the most technologically developed state uh, in, in the co cyber context when that allegedly when it conducts uh, cyber attacks it doesn't necessarily rely on uh, in-house expertise uh, but hires hacking groups uh, in order to conduct those uh, those attacks but regardless of that uh, uh, how could this fifth geneva convention look like uh, what could did say well there are several problems here uh, should it be a convention that prohibits the possession of certain cyber capabilities uh, so should it be an arms control treaty like the treaty on the prohibition of recent no on the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, that will entail verification serious verifications issues by the way uh, or should it be a treaty that addresses the use of uh, cyber capabilities uh, like IHL treaties. Uh, and if so, uh, the, even the language is, is, is uh, difficult to agree on. Uh, so some states like Russia and China uh, uh, use expressions like information weapons, like information security while uh, western states uh, prefer to use expressions like cyber weapons and cyber security which are narrower in scope they fear that using expressions like information security uh, uh, so the use of information to destabilize states uh, can be used as a trampoline to curb freedom of expression on, on the internet. So even the language here of what should be prohibited, or what should be the object of this treaty is, uh, is difficult to agree on. And then there are, of course, practical problems, practical problems that are related to the, uh, to, to the historical period we live in. Uh, let's face it, many governments uh, that have a populist or a sovereignist orientation uh, do not believe in multilateralism, uh, do not believe in a global by governance uh, and therefore this is not the best of times uh, to conclude any treaty uh, uh, let alone a treaty on uh, on cyber warfare so this might explain why so far what we have seen is, uh, is is a focus on not rules not on binding rules but on uh, so-called norms of responsible state behavior these have been adopted at different levels, for instance, at the UN. There is a group of governmental experts that has met for several years and has concluded whenever they manage to achieve consensus reports containing also norms of uh, uh, responsible state behavior. Uh, these are not legally binding rules, okay? This is soft law. Uh, and of course, there is a huge difference, uh, not just uh, because of uh, the, 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 the qualification, but because of the consequences. If you breach a legally binding rule, the victim state can resort to countermeasures. If you breach, inverted commas, a norm of responsible state behavior, you don't have that means. At best, that you can resort to retortions, which is what, by the way, Albania did a couple of months ago by cutting diplomatic ties with, uh, with, with Iran and giving 24 hours to all staff of the Iranian embassy to leave the country. There are also, of course, reputational consequences. It looks much worse if you breach a binding rule than if you breach a norm of responsible state, uh, state behavior. Uh, an important role in developing these norms of non-binding norms of responsible state behavior has been played by non-state actors. Uh, so really, they are still in the stage from, uh, from states in this area. Uh, these non state actors can be academics. I'm sure you all heard uh, in your, during your studies of the Tallinn Manual. Uh, uh, these uh, sta these non-state actors uh, can be uh, corporations. Uh, Microsoft, um, a few years ago, drafted some 
some norms uh, that were aimed uh, at, uh, at diffusing conflicts in cyberspace and the use of offensive malware. Uh, they also suggest, they even suggested back in 2017 uh, of turning these norms they've developed into a digital Geneva Convention. Uh, this so far has fallen on deaf ears, and I'm not suggesting here that these norms are necessarily good as they are. But this is just to really show how the role, the major role played by non state actors is. Does this have any point? Uh, I think it does. It does, A, because uh, as has been said by a commentator, they can be used as the laboratory for testing potential future legally binding rules. See how states react, see if they are successful, see if states take them into account, even if they don't have to. And second, uh, longer, more, more, more down, longer down the road, uh, they could influence, have an impact on state behavior and therefore might contribute to the shaping up of uh, customary rules in, in this area. So what next? As we said, we are talking about the future. What, if you ask me what, is, uh, what uh, will the future bring uh, for, for, for these uh, different options? I think if we are going to have a treaty, this treaty is likely to be more on, uh, uh, on the operations on which there is larger consensus that they are bad and that they shouldn't be conducted by states against other states. And I'm referring to the operation, the cyber attacks against physical infrastructures, uh, cyber operations that disrupt the functioning of national critical infrastructures, particularly. There is quite a broad consensus from states in different uh, regions and uh, political uh, camps that uh, this uh, is something that is in the interest of everyone that they are not conducted. So perhaps the treaty should start by looking into, uh, or negotiations for a treaty should, should start by looking at this type of cyber operations, leaving aside the very controversial ones, the ones that affect human intelligence, the ones that affect uh, cyber influence operations, uh, because these type of operations uh, touches uh, upon very delicate, delicate issues like uh, uh, internet governance, uh, the protection of human rights on the internet and uh, and the like. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, likely that we'll see uh, uh, perhaps at first regional treaties rather than a universal treaty that regulates cyber warfare. So I think it's more like, at regional level, it's more likely to have uh, uh, like-minded states that will agree on certain issues. And it is therefore not surprising, by the way, that re in regional organizations like the Council of Europe, like the European Union, like the Organization of American States, like the African Union, have come up with a certain legally binding and non-legally binding documents that address at least certain aspects related to cybersecurity. So it's likely to be a, a, a bottom-up, I think, approach in a similar way to that that we have witnessed with regard to uh, nuclear weapons, where first we had treaties that have denuclearized uh, rather uh, certain areas of the world, uh, and then and only at the end of this process, a couple of years ago, we had the treaty uh, that bans uh, the uh, nuclear weapons uh, globally. I mean, successfully or not, I'll, I'll leave that, uh, that to you. Uh, that's my prediction. Let's meet again in 15 years and see if I was right or not. But uh, I think I think I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that I'm one of the few obstacles remaining between you and drinks and celebrations with your family. So I'll probably stop here, but best of luck for, uh, for the rest of your career. And uh, well, I hope you'll uh, remember the time you spent at the Geneva Academy with fondness. Congratulations again. Thank you, Marco. You have a standing invitation in 15 years' time. So now, 
Now comes one of the crucial moments uh, of the ceremony, the award of the original prize. So to that effect, I warmly welcome two personalities who are members of the Henri Dunant Prize Foundation. Mr. Francois Bunion, who is a key figure of IHL, the prolific author on IHL and the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, and also a, fem a former member of the ICSC uh, Assembly. He will give the laudatio and will announce the 2022 Henri Dunant Prize recipient. Then we will have Miss Cécile Martinez Dunant, who is the great, great grandniece of Henri Dunant. Imagine, isn't it incredible? Thank you so much. We are truly honored to have you with us tonight. So now I give the floor to François Bunion. Thank you. Dear Professor Gaggioli, Distinguished professors, dear students, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, without Henri Dunant, none of us would be today in this room. As you know, he was not only the founder of the Red Cross and White Crescent movement, but also the promoter of the original Geneva Convention of 22nd August, 1864, which marks the starting point of contemporary international humanitarian law. All of us, therefore, have a debt to his memory. However, for many years, the life and achievements of Henry Dunant were actually little known. Within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement, he disappeared behind his legend, which did not really tally with historical evidence. And I would say the Red Cross felt comfortable with his legend and had therefore little motivation for historical research. In 1975, my old friend Roger Durand created the Henry Dunant Society in Geneva to stimulate historical research on the life and achievements of Henry Dunant. In half a century of intensive work, the society organized conferences, colloquiums, and published a number of books and articles based on historical research on first-hand documents, which provided a better knowledge of the life, personality, and achievements of Henry Dunant. At the initiative of one of the very active members of the society, Mrs. Pierrette Bourgedalgue, the society created in 2004 a foundation with the objective of stimulating historical and legal research in international humanitarian law or in other fields of activity of Henri Dunant by rewarding outstanding papers on humanitarian law or other aspects of the spiritual heritage of Henri Dunant. Mrs. Murgadag also made a very generous donation which constituted the initial capital of the foundation. As stated in its charter, the objective of the foundation is I quote, to reward an exceptional academic work which contributes to deepen, spread, and renew the ideas of Henri Dunant through law. The Henri Dunant Prize for Research has been awarded every year since 2005 in partnership with the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. In practice, the Academy makes a preliminary selection of the LLM papers submitted in the current year in order to identify among the memoirs that respond to the objectives and criteria of the Henry Dunant Prize, the best papers in academic terms. The papers thus selected are submitted to a jury made up of two professors of the Academy 
one representative of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and two members of the Board of Trustees of the Foundation, the Henry Dudon Prize Foundation. This year, the members of the jury received three LLM papers selected by the professors of the Academy, all of them of outstanding quality. And I would like to avail myself of this opportunity to express on behalf of the Board of Trustees of the Foundation, deep gratitude to the professors of the Academy who made this preliminary selection. After having read with due attention all three papers submitted to them, and keeping in mind the criteria sta stated in the Charter of the Foundation, the members of the jury unanimously decided to award the 2022 Henry Dunant Prize for Research to Mrs. Sophie Timmermans. for her memoir, addressing the non-homogeneous nature of the civilian population in the conduct of hostilities, enhanced protection through differentiation. The members of the jury noticed that Mrs. Timmerman's paper addresses an issue which is both timeless and of a burning actuality. Timeless since the fate of the most vulnerable has been a concern in all wars, as evidenced by the famous play by the Greek poet Euripides, The Trojan Women. At the same time, the issue is of a burning actuality since the fate of the most vulnerable is a major concern in today's armed conflicts from Afghanistan to Syria, to Ukraine, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sahel region, and many other regions affected by war. The members of the jury also noted the originality of Mrs. Timmerman's approach. Indeed, there is an abundant literature on the issue of enhanced protection as a response to specific vulnerabilities in the perspective of the law of captivity or the law of occupation. On the other hand, the question of the impact of such regimes of enhanced protection on the conduct of hostilities has so far hardly been studied. Mrs. Timmermans did not study this issue only in the perspective of the specific protection of women. She also considered all other vulnerabilities generating specific protection needs, such as the fate of children, persons with a handicap, the elderly, etc. To take just one concrete example mentioned in Mrs. Timmermans' paper, how can a person with a handicap reach an underground shelter in case of an air raid? Mrs. Timmermans did not limit herself to studying this issue in the light of international humanitarian law. She also examined it in the light of international human rights law and put in evidence the interactions and complementarity between those two branches of the law. Last but not least, Mrs. Timmerman's paper is supported by a thesis, a thesis in the medieval sense of the term, namely an underlying argument. Namely, in the conduct of hostilities, the belligerents must take into account the fact that the civilian population is not an homogeneous group, but the specific groups are entitled to enhanced protection on account of their vulnerability. 
Such regimes of enhanced protection should not only be respected in the case of captivity or occupation, they also have a bearing on the conduct of hostilities and the belligerents must respect them in the conduct of attack or defense. There is no question that this paper perfectly meets the criteria for the attribution of the Henry Dunant Prize, since the fight against discrimination and the protection of the most vulnerable have been at the heart of Henry Dunant's battles. By calling upon the belligerents to make to take into account the regimes of enhanced protection in the conduct of hostilities, Mrs. Timmerman really follows the steps of Henry Dunant. Such advocacy is fully consonant with the spiritual heritage of Henry Dunant and therefore fully consonant with the criteria of the Henry Dunant Prize. Dear Mrs. Timmerman, I am pleased to convey to you the warmest congratulations of the members of the jury, as well as the warmest congratulations of the members of the Board of Trustees of the Henry Dunant Prize. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dunion. Uh, I have to say that uh, we are very grateful to the Henri Dunant Prize Foundation because a graduation ceremony without you would not be a graduation ceremony. So thank you so much. Now I give the floor to Sophie. Thank you very much, Francois for the very kind words and also for the introduction. I feel like a lot of what I'm gonna say has actually already been said. So my paper starts from a very simple idea, which is that people are differently affected in armed conflict based on certain characteristics, such as gender, age, or whether they have a disability or not. Civilian experiences in conflict are very varied. And indeed, international humanitarian law or IHL is not blind to this. However, when we look at the rules that deal with the conduct of hostilities, we see that all these experiences are lumped together under one, that of civilian. The main idea of my paper, therefore, was to explore exactly how people are differently affected by armed conflict in the conduct of hostilities, and how we can consider this in the application of the principles of distinction, proportionality, and precautions. Of course, indeed, when we talk about anything that has to do with differences and differentiations, we first have to go back to the basics, which is non-discrimination. In international humanitarian law, we have the prohibition on adverse distinction. However, on the other hand, we also allow certain favorable distinctions that are based on vulnerabilities. The Geneva Conventions and the additional protocols themselves already offer protection to certain people that are deemed more vulnerable. This includes women, but also children, the elderly, persons with disabilities, and the wounded and sick. Non-discrimination is indeed not only an issue of international humanitarian law, it is also an integral part of human rights law. We also see that human rights law in this area is much better elaborated upon than the prohibition of adverse distinction in IHL. Both branches of law are complementary on the subject, and therefore we can use the more elaborated notion of non-discrimination in human rights law to interpret and influence the prohibition on adverse distinction. Different notions such as equality, direct and indirect discrimination, favorable distinctions, and evolutions that have taken place in the field of human rights law can therefore be used to enhance our understanding of adverse distinction in IHL. On this basis, I wanted to explore how we can look at these differences in the civilian population. However, there was one main hurdle to this. It is generally not considered that the principle of adverse distinction also applies in the conduct of hostilities. It is indeed a rule that is usually seen to apply when persons find themselves in the power of a party to the conflict when we deal with rules on their treatment. The prohibition is therefore not considered in the conduct of hostilities when parties carry out attacks. However, other authors have made very good arguments to say that this prohibition should also apply, and I decided to follow this reasoning in my conclusions. 
My paper analyzes the three principles that deal with the conduct of hostilities, namely the principle of distinction, proportionality, and precautions. It comes to two main conclusions. Firstly, that there are actually biases in the notion of civilian. We see that some people are considered more civilian than others based on certain characteristics, such as gender and age. On the other hand, certain groups of the civilian population also suffer from more harm and risk. And sometimes this harm and risk is invisible exactly because of who they are. Firstly, I looked at the absolute basis, which is the principle of distinction, meaning that parties should distinguish between combatants and the civilian population. We see in this sense that women and children are much more regarded to be civilian than men, for example, and therefore there is a clear moral assumption that we include in the application of the principle. Military age men are, seen, are less seen as civilians and therefore we see that there is discrimination based on age and gender. If we then move on to the principle of proportionality, meaning that it must be assessed uh, whether the attack will cause excessive incidental harm to civilians, we see the same moral assumption coming back, sometimes excluding harm based on who people are. Another element of this analysis is also that certain categories of civilians actually do face more harm. That is either direct or indirect. Children, for example, are much more likely to die from explosive weapons because of their smaller physiological makeup than adults. I therefore argue that it would lead to a much more accurate proportionality analysis if we include how people are harmed differently because of these characteristics. If we do not consider this, it could lead to certain segments of the population being disproportionately harmed. Then last, but certainly not least, the precautions that the defending and attacking party must take to avoid or minimize harm to civilians. I once again come to, come to the back the same conclusion, which is that these precautions would be much more effective if we consider how people are different. For example, indeed, evacuations would need to consider the needs of persons with disabilities and reduced mobility because they, there is a risk that they will be left behind. In general, we do see Oh, well, I see from my paper, at least, that uh, considering these differences within the civilian population actually need, leads to a much more accurate interpretation and application of these principles. Moreover, if we ignore this, then in certain circumstances, this could also lead to prohibited discrimination. The challenge is that all of this requires available and accessible information on who the civilian population is and how we should deal with it. It requires information not only about how certain effects uh, have an influence on certain civilians, but also specific information in the operational context that the parties deal with. There's also some clear challenges, unfortunately, that are connected to such a differentiated approach. The first one is that if we don't do it carefully enough, this could lead to stereotyping, which would be more harmful in the end. Moreover, as I say that there is a clear need for disaggregated data, gathering this is also a huge challenge in practice because of multiple reasons. Finally, there's also clear operational challenges in armed conflict since parties usually have to deal with limited means or limited time, which does not really allow for a very elaborate analysis at times. However, despite these challenges, I do really feel that when parties increase their understanding of these differences, the ways to accommodate them and their capacity to do so, that this will improve the protection of the civilian population as a whole, but also its different segments. Of course, no speech is complete if I would not thank a whole number of people. So I would like to thank, uh, firstly, the Henri Dunant Prize Foundation and the members of the jury. It's a true honor for me to, um, to get this prize. But also like to thank my supervisor, Professor Gajoli, for her guidance during this process. Then last but certainly not least, I would like to thank all my friends that are here today for their amazing times that we spent this year. Also for all the brainstorming and the proofreading that we did together. And I would also like to thank my family for the support because otherwise I would not have been able to study here and I would not have been able to finish the year successfully. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention and I really look forward to celebrating the rest of the evening with you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. We have the official award with Ms. Martinez Dunant. Congratulations. 
Congratulations, Sophie. It was really an excellent thesis. Wonderful. We had many excellent thesis, and it was very difficult to choose, actually. Uh, fortunately enough, we have also the best LLM and best MTJ papers. So now is a moment where I'm going to announce the persons who were selected for, uh, pre-selected for these different prizes. So for the best LLM papers, the nominees were Mafalda Carrera de Oliveira, The nominees, Matthias Kuipers, Elena Hamachan, Helmer Jonelik, Teresa Jurgensen, Alexandra Leibova, Edward Millet, Chiara Rossellini, Sophie Timmermans, Patricia Valencia Calego, Helen Veda. Uh, And the winner is Edward Millet for Open Source Intelligence, Armed Conflict, and the Rights to Privacy and Data Protection. So Edward is not in the room, but on the screen. Professor Gadjoli, faculty members, fellow students, good evening. Firstly, and most importantly, a huge congratulations to you all in graduating today. I am honoured to have spent the last year studying alongside such a dedicated, motivated and intelligent group of lawyers, and I am only sad not to be in Geneva with you all this evening. I am, however, delighted to have been awarded the LLM Best Paper Award, which comes with a 1,000 franc cash prize generously offered by the Academy faculty. Judging by the ongoing collapse in the British economy, that award appears to be getting more and more valuable every day. Turning then to the paper I've written, it looks at the rapidly emerging field of open source investigations, or OSINT, and its use in armed conflict and humanitarian settings. Some of you may be familiar with the work in this area of organisations such as Bellingcat, who draw on publicly available information to investigate and expose human rights violations. Now, while OSINT presents a phenomenal opportunity for civil society and humanitarian actors to wrest control of the information flow during armed conflict out of the hands of states, in my paper, I highlight the existence of serious risks for civilians posed by the use of this technology in armed conflict settings by states, NGOs, and international organizations alike. One of the core focuses of my paper is the use of OSINT by states and the risks of violating both IHL and the rights to privacy and data protection enshrined in international human rights law. My paper highlights the limited protections that IHL affords to informational privacy during wartime, even though we now live in a world where confidential personal data can be used coercively against the civilian population to devastating effect. Imagine, if you will, an occupying power using medical data to target a specific ethnic group, or an armed group analysing published data to figure out where demobilised child soldiers are being securely housed. In that context, I argue that the human rights to privacy and data protection can afford individuals protection from intrusive and potentially coercive uses of OSINT by states during armed conflict, serving to fill a gaping lacuna in IHL's framework. Importantly, it does not matter that the information collected via OSINT is publicly available online. I argue that the human right to privacy is still applicable because we, as internet users, have a reasonable expectation of privacy on the internet regarding our personal information. Now, much still has to be done to develop a fit-for-purpose legal and ethical framework within IHL and IHRL to regulate and mitigate these harms and yet still allow OSINT to be a powerful and democratizing technology. But I hope my paper can contribute to at least identifying areas where crucial work must start to happen. I'd like just to finish then by again thanking Professor Gaggioli for supervising my work on this paper with such enthusiasm and patience and thanking the Academy, and of course, thanking you, my dear classmates. 
congratulations again to you all. Let me turn now to the nominees for the best MTJ paper. Louise Besley, David Galishvali, Claudia Gonzalez Garcia, Cameron Case, Francesco Pipicella, Catherine Haita, Laura Sevilla Maldonado, Sarah Sarget. And the winner is. Francesco Pipicella for the Catholic social responsibilities to strengthen state institutions in post conflict environments. Thank you very much for this prize. I want to thank the Academy. I want to thank my supervisor, Professor Sandoval helping me from the beginning. And the idea behind my paper is that uh, is to come from an idea of Professor Barber, who say that the goal of a state is to pursue the well-being of its citizen. And it needs some certain aspect to do this. It needs legitimacy, it needs the rule of law, it needs sovereignty. And when he lack those aspects, the state fail. And this is its fragility. And its fragility is dangerous. And when a state is fragile, it needs allies. And I try to identify in my paper multinational cooperation as a potential good ally for strengthening state institutions in situation of fragility. Of course, this requires a double effort. From cooperation, it requires to accept the idea that combating fragility is part of their social response of their corporate social responsibility as part of fulfilling the social contract chaos instability cannot no longer be considered like a ladder to climb for predatory companies but has to be considered as a threat for security for stability for human rights and for transitional justice on the other hand i hope that my paper will encourage expert and practitioner in our field who often have a prejudice against collaborating with private in trying to put aside this rivalry and try to join forces to fight this battle. I think that it's time to not fall into the trap of anti-capitalist rhetoric, but through our collaboration and through our impact, we can make rule of law theories, human rights theory, tools for turning cap capitalism into the best allied of our work. Therefore, therefore, I think that we should trust private more and private has to show us that they're worthy of our trust. I will conclude my, my speech by thanking a lot to you again by thanking uh, the Academy for the prize, even for the economic prize, it helped. Uh, and uh, I want to thank, to thank a lot also Professor Canale from Bocconi and Professor Barber from Oxford, who was uh, deeply inspired me. And uh, I want to dedicate this prize to my amazing roommates. They are, you, are, you are all the best and you helped me a lot going to this, all of you. And uh, if my girlfriend is watching, I love you. <laughs> Congratulations to you all. I would like also to uh, acknowledge the fact that Professor Giovanni Di Stefano and Professor Sevan Garibian participated in a committee to select respectively the best uh, LLM paper and the best MTJ papers. So I thank them very much for that. So now comes the climax with the actual graduation. So I'm going to call the names of students. Uh, I will do my very best to pronounce your names correctly. I received some recordings for some of you. So I, I trained, I promise that I trained. 
So we'll start with the list of LLM students uh, graduating tonight. Summa cum laude, Matthias Kuipers. You can come here and Maud is going to give you your diploma. Elina Hammerstrom. Then you stay here, right? Stefan Hare. Julia Marini. Edward Millet, not here. Dominic Steinbrasha. Carson Thomas. Sophie Timmermans. Patricia Valencia Gallego. So you can already have a beautiful group photo here. And at the end of the ceremony, once people get out and you have a cocktail, we can still do also pictures uh, outside for individual pictures, okay? So I call the magna cum laude team. Filson Ayman. Nicola Borgesano. Delphine Camerie. Shebani Devadasan, Katarina Grossos, Francesca Gortan, Helma Jule, Teresa Jurgensen, Lauren Kennis, Andrea La Fuente Calvino, Eva Lovens, Julie Le Paul, Alexandra Leibova, Mireya Mars Catala, Lia Olaseinde, Chiara Rossellini, Oscar Scheible, Salome Salome Schiblatze. Perfect. So I continue. Now I call the cum laude. Arnaz Amer. Amanda Benoit. Mafalda Carrera de Oliveira. Alisa Hiltzbold. Titiana Cucanias. Laura Cristina Meya Gallejo. Priya Sepaha. The Juhan Itikut Chinchir. Silvia Tasotti. Natalie Yusuf. And last but not least, I call Carla Ayivi, Ruchika Dash, Kumaira Farukwe, Derek Kimani, Zamzam Koryo, Camilla Reis Ferraz Rodriguez, It's also Saez Martinez, Andrei Vasilieu. Helen Vada.
I move now to the MTJ group. So summa cum laude, we have Catherine Rebecca Darvik. And it's Carolina Buna Belena. Diana Cristina Corredor Hill. Alexandra D'Agostini Erstad. David Goliashvili. Claudia Gonzalez Garcia. Cameron Cates. Ellen Murphy. Isabella Ottoni Pena Bonascimento. Catherine Reiter. Kelsey Schumanz. Elizabeth Storley. Sarah Sorget. Magna cum laude, Adam Adi, Louis Bessie, Marie Boularos, Sharon Brackman. Leticia Colucci, Sara Kiran Dodia, Jessica Dumas, Jean-Noël Pernet, Gabriela Maria de Santana Gonzalves, Amila Lelo, Tubia Mastonchueva, Catra Nur, Francesco Pipicella, Giulia Cilesa Ugu, Maya Yelkin. Sofia Campos Sanchez, Alessia Cirillo, Christine Chobini da Silva, Shima Esmailian, Alba Jacupi, Patu Jalo, Ivy Mungbata. Jean-Paul Nizigi Yamana. Francis Nono. Tyron Kalimila Heva Diganaje. Shafak Rahimi. Sevilla Maldonado. Laura Elizabeth Alexandria Dina Babayeva. Swazati Rossetti, Bruna Perestrello, Last but not least, Zina Babayeva. Rosati Rosati. I'm sorry, you don't. Sorry, you there. <laughs> Congratulations. So now I go to the third team, the Exmas participants. It's a long list, huh? Be ready. Abdulrahim Omran Sadek. 
Amlu Filipa. Anastasia Stella. Aria Rina. Boliar Gaito Philippe. Burns Laura. Defina Emily Catherine Pingon. Andras Dardi Orbat. Danny Diogo. Deborah Ferdinand. Romaric Ferraro. Terry Hackett. Sharia Hijep. Itan de Tacoma. Nuna Matlouf Kassab. Yaroslav Krasny. Esther Quincy. Lydia Leoni. Hendrik Loach. Mareva Malzacher. Melanie Moore. Britta Christine Nicolman. Collins Podiambo. Gianfranco Olivera Astete. Beatrice Parentella. Supriya Rao. Alicia Sanders Zachary. Amina O'Leary Saudi. Mandy Lisa Margaret Stewart. Chantal Touma. Tania Emilia Tuominen. Surab Wali. Fabian Vilches Garcia. Yue Yao. Congratulations to you and to all of you who are online. I admire you very much. I don't know how you managed to combine, you know, works often a full-time job with this, uh, with this Xmas. So congratulations, really. And now it's the end of the ceremony. I'm sure that you have your hands very warm, that you're dirty, hungry. And so we have everything for you there. There is a beautiful cocktail, cocktail just outside uh, the room. I would like to thank again all the participants, speakers in this ceremony, to thank you students, to thank professors. We are marvelous professors. I think that without these marvelous professors, we would not be able to reach the results that you, you reached uh, this year. We have also wonderful teaching assistants uh, and we have a wonderful team behind. I'd like to Thank very much the student office, Francesca, Alina, Anna, uh, who prepared this ceremony. I'd like to, to thank my right hand, Maud Benet, who supervised the whole thing. I'd like to thank, of course, the teaching assistants. Did I already do that? Yeah. And really all the academy staff. This success is the success of the whole team. So congratulations and all the very best for your future. Thank you. Enjoy. Bye.